Well, good to be back. Thank you all for being here this morning. Today we're going to consider the transfiguration of our Lord, a very interesting event. And, uh, of course, we have the, the Super Bowl today, right? How many of you are rooting for the Chiefs? And no, not too many. Well, they already just, they just won it last year, right? Didn't they, didn't they win last year? Yeah. That's the only reason I remember it. I don't even really care that much who's playing, but uh, this is Super Bowl 58. Anybody here remember Super Bowl one? Yeah, right? What's funny is that uh, 58 more years from now, it's very unlikely that many people remember who won the game, let alone even who played, right? And yet we remember the transfiguration, we remember some things about Jesus' life 2,000 years later, so pretty interesting. Um, we're gonna read from Mark chapter nine, and uh, two through nine, but I'm actually gonna stretch it out a little bit because there's some cool stuff just before and just after. And then I'm gonna weave in because there are three accounts of the transfiguration in the New Testament, one in each of the synoptic gospels, and uh, they just each give just a little bit more um, information. So I might introduce a phrase or two that isn't in your version of Mark. It's going to come from either Matthew or Luke. Um, but before this, setting the context that Matthew 16, Mark 8, Luke 9 all talk about um, Jesus announcing his suffering, his death, and rising after three days. Now, this wasn't very popular, especially with Peter. Remember what Peter said? Oh, Lord, no, 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 this is not going to happen to you. God forbid this should ever happen to you. And Jesus said, oh, come on, Peter, fuck up there, right? No, that's not what he said. He said, get behind me, Satan. You have not the things of God, but the things of man in mind. And that's pretty strong verbiage, right? You know, Jesus, who never says anything um, Never mumbled a discouraging word. How does it go? Right. But uh, he said something pretty harsh to Peter at that point. But just before this, in verse 9, 1, he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. That's our launching point for this event. So let's look at Mark uh, 9, 2 through 9 in a little bit more. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves apart, and he was transfigured before them. Literally, his face shone like the sun. His clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And uh, there appeared to him, to them, in glorious splendor, according to uh, one of the Gospels, Elijah and Moses who were now talking with Jesus. And they spoke about his departure, and the word in the Greek is exodus, we'll come back to that, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Then Peter said to Jesus, hey, Rabbi, it's, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings. And the word there is the same as we use for tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying, for they were all terrified. Then, while Peter was still speaking, a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him. Luke adds, he is my chosen one, and Matthew says, with him I am well pleased, but they all say, listen to him. And when the disciples had heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified, but Jesus came and touched them and said, get up, do not be afraid. That part comes from Matthew. Suddenly they looked around. They saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And here's chapter, uh, or, uh, verses 10 through 13 I want to read as well. They kept this matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, but they did not recognize him, and they've done everything to him that they wished, just as it was written about him. 
And Matthew adds this, in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Lord, give us insight into this word. We've heard the story before. We ask you, God, even as you showed something amazing to the disciples on that mountain, show us something new in your word today. Amen. So I've heard sometimes people will ask something like, why do we need to bother with the Old Testament? Doesn't the New Testament supersede or replace it? Or how about this? You ever heard this one? I don't like the God of the Old Testament. So angry and vengeful. vengeful. Can't we just stick with Jesus? Oh, who, of course, never said anything uncomfortable, right? And all that stuff in the Old Testament, right? Legalism, blood sacrifices, unrighteous king, ancient history. That's gross and gory. Yuck, I don't want that. The New Testament is all about love, right? Or, or my favorite. Why talk about the Old Testament at all? Jesus is only in the New Testament, right? Well, songwriter and biblical scholar Michael Card put it well when he said, we can't skip over the Old Testament and go straight to the New Testament. Those who do not only misinterpret most of what the Bible has to say, but sadly, they miss it. So today's scripture is a vital corrective to many of these kinds of thoughts and so much more besides. It's interesting that Jesus uniquely fulfills 48 specific messianic prophecies, 48, and also fulfills all of over 300 general, general biblical prophecies about Messiah. Now, somebody calculated the odds of this. I don't know how they did that, but it's a ridiculous number. They came up with a probability of one in 10 to the 157th power. Any scientists in here? What's 10 to the 157th power? Well, I'll tell you what it is. Take the number of particles in the cosmos, all of them. Multiply that by itself, and that's what you get. Right. So it's a pretty unlikely outcome. But to say that Jesus is absent from the Old Testament is absurd. In the Old Testament, God demonstrates his love and his faithfulness, his correction and his mercy, his holiness and wisdom in such a way as to show humanity many times over that we are completely unable to live lives of faithfulness, generosity, and righteousness apart from God. And throughout all these histories, God foretells through the prophets that one will come who alone will live perfectly on our behalf and who himself will become the atoning sacrifice for the sins and shortcomings of all generations before and since. Alastair Begg puts it nicely when he says that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament we find the new concealed, while in the New Testament we find the old revealed. I like that. Today's text is the explication of that statement. So let's, let's look at context first. After six days it begins. What happened six days ago? Well, they were talking about who do they say that I am? And Peter's confession of Christ, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, for flesh and blood did not re reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. And he goes on to talk about the founding of the church and it will not prevail against, against the gates of hell. Um, keys to the kingdom, the prediction of the passion, death and resurrection and all that get me behind me, Satan stuff. And then he says this interesting phrase, some here standing will not see death before they see the kingdom of heaven in power. Now, at this point, John the Baptist has already been beheaded. And Jesus then calls these disciples and said, hey, boys, come with me. We're going to go away uh, on our own for a little bit. And they went up the mountain to pray. And here's a little stop for a minute. They went up the mountain to pray. Jesus took them, and he did this often. Jesus would sometimes go out all night and pray while the disciples slept. And any time there was a big ministry undertaking, it seems Jesus would disappear for a little bit and go pray, all right? So if the Son of Man, the, the, the God-Man become flesh, has to go and pray before doing something big, why do we think that we don't need to go pray when we're facing something big? Well, we do. So Jesus gives us a good example here. When something big is happening, go and pray. Take that, um, that prayer list 
and go pray those prayers. I think that's a very cool thing to do. So he took his three most, uh, most trusted disciples, and uh, elsewhere in the Old Testament it says whenever there's something to be contested, always present two or three witnesses. But he also cautioned them, don't tell anybody until after the resurrection. And they didn't. The other disciples didn't know anything about this until after Pentecost. And Peter actually makes reference to this in his second letter, uh, chapter 116. He says, for we did not follow cleverly designed stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven, and we were with him on that sacred mountain. So there before them, Jesus was changed. Metamorphized is the word, form upon form, or another form in addition to the one that is seen. It reminds me of where Paul says that we're going to be transformed. Same word, metamorphized, one degree of glory to another. And uh, John, in his prelude to his gospel, talks about Jesus bringing us another grace in place of a former. And his clothes became dazzling light, like a flash of lightning, his face like the sun. The light came from within him. Not like Moses. Remember what happened to Moses? He went up on the mountain, and he talked to God, and he came down. What was going on? And people said, whoa, Moses, what happened to your face? You're like glowing, dude. Cover that thing up, would you? That's kind of scary, right? So they told him to cover that thing up. The shining glory of God showed through the divinity of Jesus, not as a reflection, but a glow that came from within. And then Moses and Elijah says they appeared in glorious splendor, but they weren't glowing. So they did not bear that Shekinah glory of the Lord that the Old Testament talks about. And speaking of the Old Testament, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 tells us something that I think is pertinent here. In the past, the writer of Hebrews tells us, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. Get this, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Well, speaking of Moses and Elijah, um, who's Moses? He's the Old Testament lawgiver, and Elijah was one of the premier prophets. And, of course, there's tellings at the end of the New Old Testament about Elijah must come first before Messiah. So here's Moses and Elijah. Now, wait a minute. These guys have been gone for a while, right? Moses has been dead for like 1,500 years. Oh, but wait, Elijah didn't die, right? Elijah was taken up. But still, that was 900 years ago. But that's pretty cool when you think about it because here are two people from the past of Israel and Moses at least died, Elijah was gone, and yet we see them with Jesus. Of course, I'm curious, how did the disciples know it was Moses and Elijah? <laughs> I haven't really totally figured that out, but I kind of go back to both Philip and Nathaniel, which we talked about when I was here the last time, but also um, Peter, recognizing Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, hey, cool, Peter, you didn't know that by yourself. It was the Holy Spirit that revealed that to you. Anyway, um, John says in his prelude again, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came in Jesus Christ. Moses himself had prophesied that God would send another prophet like Moses. As it says in Deuteronomy 18, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from among your brothers, it is to him you shall listen. Now, many times Jesus and others had referred to the sum of God's revelation in the Old Testament as the law and the prophets. When they said the law and the prophets, they're talking, they're talking about everything that God has revealed. So with Moses, here's, he's the lawgiver. And Elijah, one of the premier prophets who was taken up into heaven, we see this continuity of the Old Testament to the New. And throughout this whole passage, there's what I like to call hyperlinks. There's these little, like, a word, a phrase, a situation, a vision that gives us a connection to something that went on in the Old Testament. But what the upshot of all this is really cool when you look at it two ways. First of all, the disciples, during this transfiguration, 
are allowed to see Jesus' full divinity, which they had never known. They had seen him in his humanity. They recognized that. They knew there was something more going on than just Jesus being a pretty cool teacher. They weren't quite sure what, but now they see his full divinity. Now, the prophets got to see Jesus' full humanity, which they had never known. They had seen Jesus in his full divinity in heaven, where they'd been hanging around for all this time, right? But they'd never seen Jesus in his simple humanity. And I thought, that's pretty cool. So there's, there's a cool completion all the way around this whole situation. So now we have Jesus at the center, and we see that he is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, of all that God was doing and foretelling throughout the entire Old Testament. But the story isn't over. There's more to discuss, apparently, although only Luke gives us any indication about the subject of their conversation. And the subject is Jesus' coming departure, the word is exodus, which is to be accomplished in Jerusalem. And wouldn't we love to have a transcript of the entire conversation? That would be very cool. We don't have that. But we have this word, exodus, a new exodus for all humanity, an exodus from judgment and death. So we'll get into that a little bit more and what that means. Well, leave it to Peter. You know, I love Peter. He's just great. Peter stirs things up. He always does this, right? He says, hey, let's camp right here. This is cool. He was scared senseless, okay? He didn't, it didn't stop him from shooting off his mouth. Go figure. But it would be Peter who tries to wrangle some kind of control over an entirely unique and explicable, inexplicable situation. So basically what Peter's saying is, let's hold on to what we got. Let's put God's glory in a box. This is great. Heck, we could sell tickets to this. Much better than all this confusing stories and predictions of death. And, oh, man, that's whole. The crowds will eat this up. Let's, let's sell this. So some people think that Peter was making some kind of reference to the Feast of Tabernacles or Booze, which commemorates both the wanderings in the desert of the Israelites before they were permitted to enter the Promised Land, but also recognition that our, our true home is not on this earth. Good, you, good on you, Peter. Check. You got that right. But Peter's intent was not about the future. He was intent on the past, holding on to what he knew. Peter desperately wants to hold on to what he can see, something that affirms all his hopes and defers all his fears. But holding on here would perhaps prevent what God was going to do there. And like Peter, perhaps, sometimes, we want most desperately what is not at all what we need most desperately. For example, we don't need more freedom. What we need is more obedience. We don't need more choices. We've got lots of choices. What we need is more surrender. We don't need more money, honestly, folks. What we need is more purpose. We don't need to stay where we are. We need to get up and go where God is sending us. We cannot stay on the mountaintop. The valley of the shadow of death awaits. And you see why Peter wanted to stay where he was, right? Yeah. So God the Father interrupts Peter, if you like, with a descending cloud of God's Shekinah glory, just like what we saw so many times in the Old Testament when God shows up, we see the, the cloud of God's glory. As if to say, pipe down, Peter. Here's what's really going on here, okay? This is my son, my beloved, the chosen Messiah, who was promised and foretold by the law and the prophets, attested here by two unimpeachable witnesses, and with him I am well pleased. He is about to set his face towards Jerusalem, not for the glory and the security that you crave, but to suffer and be rejected, to be beaten and killed, but whom I will raise from the dead on the third day. Listen to him. You've had the law and the prophets, true and faithful to be sure, but they only point the way. Now, all of what the law and the prophets professed and predicted is being fulfilled in him. Listen to him. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, not just another in a long line of spokespersons for God. He is, in fact, God. And what he says and does both completes and transcends the testimony of the law and the prophets in every way, but does not replace. This does not make the Old Testament irrelevant. 
For Jesus himself said to the crowds, Do not think that I have come to tear down the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one stroke will be by any means from the law pass away until all is fulfilled. From Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. But as a perfect and sinless man, Jesus fulfills the law for us in ways that we never could. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just in sight of God, says Paul, but the doers of the law will be justified. But it is more than that Jesus obeys as we could not. Jesus completes the entire legal system of substitutional atonement to which the law portends. Romans 10.4, Paul says, For Christ is the end, and the word there is telos, which can mean fulfillment or completion. Christ is the end of the law for the justification of all who believe. The writer of Hebrews gives this complete expression in chapters 8 through 10. Much too long to uh, repeat here, but the, the keynote phrase is that they serve, talking about the high priest, they serve in a sanctuary that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. We know that in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. But Jesus said, I will rebuild this temple in three days. Of course, he was speaking about himself. He is the location now of God's glory and the demonstration, the perfect representation of God's glory. And Paul goes even farther to say, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for our sake so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's more than just demonstration or representation. Jesus himself became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. Okay. Obviously, all of this was a trauma to the, those that were there with Jesus. Matthew records that they fell face down to the ground, terrified, but Jesus came and touched them. I love that Jesus, you could read the whole Gospels and just focus on the fact that Jesus touched. He touched the leper. Wow. Jesus came and touched them and said, get up. Do not be afraid. There's a message to these words that goes so far beyond this moment of terror. It's God's Shekinah glory, the presence of the law and the prophets. And it reminds us of the fact that in two other places, the people wept and shook in fear at the presence of God's glory. One of them was Moses coming down from the mountain and the, the thunder and the cloud and the people were terrified. And they said to Moses, you talk to the Lord, but don't have him talk to us. We'll do everything he says, but don't let him talk to us, for surely we will die. And then Ezra and Nehemiah, remember that situation? Where Ezra and Nehemiah found the books of the law when they were trying to rebuild the temple. And uh, the people had lost the law for a long time. And then when the law was read, they were aware how far they had fallen short of the glory of God. And they were cut to the heart. And they began to weep. And Nehemiah said, do not weep, do not cry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Go and, and fest, have a festival to the Lord, for the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Now these things, the presence of the Lord, the law and the prophets, these can be a source of fear for us when we are aware of how woefully we fall short of the glory of God. And the coming passion and death of Jesus were a source of fear and anxiety for Peter and for the others. The presence of God was the undoing of Moses and Elijah, as many others as well. Both of them cowered in fear when the Lord appeared and spoke. And we ought to have a proper fear of the Lord. This is a good thing. But Jesus' words here are a gentle reassurance. God here is present in all his glory, but it's okay. I am with you. When in your life could you hear this prayer, this, this exhortation? Do not fear. Get up. Do not be afraid. God is present in all his glory, but it's okay. I am with you. And so they looked around and they saw no one else with them, only Jesus, and him now only as they had seen him before. They're stunned into silence. Even Peter, 
Jesus now instructs them, tell no one of what you have seen until after the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Ooh, there's that weird, scary, raised from the dead stuff again. Now it's clear from later exchanges in the Gospels that the disciples, even these three, who were privileged to experience this, did not fully comprehend what they had seen or understood what it meant. That would not come until Pentecost. So on the way down the mountain, we have this little scene. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead might mean. They all believed in the resurrection at some level or not, right? But what did this mean? They didn't ask that. Instead, they asked him, what did the teachers of the law, what did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? This was Malachi that had prophesied this. Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first, restores all things. But why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? Jesus, would you quit talking about that stuff? But I do tell you, Elijah has come, and they did not recognize him. Instead, they have done everything to him that they wish, just as it was written about him. And then Matthew adds, in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking about John the Baptist. So go figure. They're coming down the mountain. God the Father has provided an absolute confirmation of both the identity and the destiny of God the Son within the context of all that has gone before in the Law and the Prophets, and the disciples still don't get it. Let's skip over that dying and rising part. What about Elijah, they asked. Let's not make the same mistake that they did. The message here is simple. It's clear and yet demanding. This is my son, my beloved, my chosen. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So there's really one takeaway from this message. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this authenticating event, this glimpse, this peek into the realm of your glory. We know that you are God and human. We know that you are the fullness of the presence of God, the exact representation of his glory, and yet you had no form or comeliness that anyone would recognize. You would disappear into a crowd. So let us remember always that you are the divine son. You are God in human flesh. For the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have beheld his glory, the glory as of the father's only begotten son. And you bring us one degree of glory after another, one grace on top of another. That we who are sinful might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That we who are earthly and mortal and broken might be being transformed from one degree of glory to another. That we who had no hope now have an eternal hope in you that we are going to be made into the representation of Jesus. That we will find our form, as Paul says in Romans 8, like Christ. So Lord, it's scary. What you call us to be and to do is scary. And yet you tell us, do not be afraid, for I am with you. Cause us to remember this and to listen to all you say and obey. These things we pray in thanks and in hope and in faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.